Good afternoon, everyone. I understand it's been a little longer than you anticipated. As the sacred assembly comes to a close, I do want to take a moment to thank you for allowing me to share with you over these last few days in some small way. I also want to acknowledge your work and your willingness to show up and be fully present at a time of great uncertainty, yes, in many of our churches, but also in our world. As I prepare to be with you today, I listen to a lesser known gospel song that encourages me, written and sung by gospel artist Charles Jenkins. The title of the song is Keep the Faith. The lyrics ask the question, what do you do? When you're standing at a crossroad, what do you do? When there's a fork in the road, what do you do? When the world is on your shoulders, what do you do? When your back is against the wall, what do you do? What do we do? We hold on and we keep the faith. Keep the faith. These are my parting words of joy to you, that you keep the faith. I offer you today these words of encouragement a gift of our sacred text is the reminder that we serve a God who never provides correction without direction. A God of grace and a God of mercy. A God who the psalmist says is as present with us in our valleys as God is with us on our mountaintops. A God of the breach and a God of repair. And even in this challenging text that we have been exploring this weekend, Isaiah 58, from the prophet Isaiah, that speaks both to the challenges of his time and the challenges of our time, God reminds us hope and healing are within our reach. If we keep the faith, there is a word of joy. In the closing verses of Isaiah, I invite you to hear these words. The Lord will guide you continuously and satisfy your needs in parched places and make your bones strong and you shall be watered like a garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt. You shall raise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interest on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interest or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob from the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In Hebrew scripture, the first testament of our sacred text, the reason to honor the Sabbath is explained in many ways. We keep the Sabbath because God created the world in six days and on the seventh day, God rested from labor and has commanded us to do the same. We keep the Sabbath because rest is holy. And without Sabbath, the busyness of life obscures the sacred. We keep the Sabbath because it, is, it sets us apart from other people and cultures and helps us remember who and whose we are. We keep the Sabbath to maintain intentionality about a time of communal worship and praise. But how one honors Sabbath has always been a matter of interpretation. In Jesus's day, just like now, many people went to the temple, but more attention was placed on refraining from activities that could be perceived as work than even going to the temple. They didn't focus on the rules for the sake of legalism as much as for the sake of faithfulness. They wanted to keep the faith. In fact, they were trying to keep the faith in times of confusion and distress. They were trying to keep the faith when people were not certain that God was always paying attention. 
They were trying to keep the faith at a time when all of their traditions and rituals had been interrupted, at a time when they could not gather together as they customarily did, at a time when there were many religions and many options of religiosity to choose from and choosing none was an increasing option that people were taking. They were trying to help people of God keep the faith in uncertain times. But Jesus challenged the notion of Sabbath about, of just being about rules. And that seems to echo the words of the prophet in this text. The Sabbath is not solely about rules. Sabbath is primarily, my friends, about restoration. It's for bringing us closer to God's intention in the world. Sabbath is about healing. Sabbath is about freeing. Sabbath is not just about us and our needs. Sabbath is about creating and holding space for all of creation to heal. Sabbath is about honoring the work of God in this world. I've read this Isaiah passage many times, many times before joining you. And I've always loved the invitation from God here to conspire together toward goodness in the world. There is partnership embedded in this text. Over and over again, Isaiah gives God's message to the people, if you do this, then good will follow. If you feed the hungry and clothe the naked, then light and healing will come. If you don't abandon others, then I will guide you. If you do away with oppressive tactics and selfish motives, then you will become the repairers of the breach. Not God, you. The restorers of the streets to dwell in, you will be the ones that do this. If you don't take the Sabbath and make it just about you, if you can move beyond self-interest to the interest of the whole, if the Sabbath is kept holy, set apart for healing and restoration and redemption and grace, then joy will follow. Isaiah says the Sabbath is meant to be a delight. It's meant to be joy. It has less to do with Sabbath rules and regulations and everything to do with getting our heads out of our own selves maybe long enough to recognize those around us. That's what happened when Jesus in the gospel of Luke was in the synagogue teaching and the woman came over who had been, been the woman came in who had been bent over for 18 years. The text does not name an infirmity that has its, uh, has its origins in some pathology. The text says explicitly that she is bent over by a spirit. And Jesus notices her even in the midst of his teaching. The Bible says that he interrupts his business as usual. He stops teaching to fully see her and to invite her in so that she might also belong. As she is coming to him, that text says, he heals her before he touches her. He declares her healed and he calls her daughter, reconciling her back into community. Some of those who were legalistic around him could only focus on the fact that he had done this on the Sabbath. Jesus reminds us also in scripture that the Sabbath is made for us. We are not made for the Sabbath. He honored Sabbath by freeing that woman. He satisfied her need and he satisfied the call for restoration. To use Isaiah's words, he loosed her from the bonds that oppressed her. He made Sabbath joy. What am I saying to you in these closing words? I'm suggesting that Sabbath is not just a day of rest, though after all you have been through these last three days and an extended time now, perhaps that's all you want. But we can't lose sight of a, par of a part of Sabbath in our crazy can't wait world that is meant to mean restoration, 
not just for ourselves, but for all of God's creation. I'm not suggesting that honoring Sabbath is optional. It's not. Sabbath is foundational to our health. Worship is foundational to our health. And although as Christians, we tend to celebrate Sabbath on Sunday for the resurrection instead of the seventh day of the week, the day is not as important as what we are doing to celebrate. I'm merely suggesting that perhaps worship is about more than gathering and singing and praying together. Perhaps worship is more than just coming together and doing our rituals. Perhaps our meeting together is more than just about business, but it's literally ascribing value and worth to the things that matter to God. I tuned in just for the closing moments of your time with your young people and young people matter to God. The work that you are doing has a deeper meaning than may be perceived on the surface. When we gather like this, when we worship, we have the opportunity to gain a glimpse of shalom. We understand that our peace is connected to the peace of those around us, that our freedom is connected to the freedom of those that are around us. We are reminded, as we have been over these last few days, that God speaks in many languages, in every language, is revealed in every culture and dwells in every space. And we leave this space, hopefully in spite of the prolonged time, renewed and energized for the work that lies ahead. Because we remember what is possible with God. So the words I leave with you today are not long, just three, keep the faith. In spite of what is buzzing around you, keep the faith. In spite of issues you still have to figure out internally and externally, keep the faith. In spite of not having been able to get it all right, keep the faith and do the work and continue to believe, not because we know all of the answers, we do not, but because we have been shown the way. Amen.